61 this evening. It's a lovely psalm, and I'm sure we've read it on several occasions. And it was only recently, to be fair, it may have been at one of the prayer groups. I honestly can't remember where it came up. But I began to look at it, and obviously in this psalm, you get the word where it says that he shall protect me lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And as we read together, that is what the devil said to Christ when he was in the wilderness, when he was being tempted. So as I looked into Psalm 91, it is believed by some that if you like, the whole Psalm is a prophecy of Christ's temptation in the wilderness. The whole thing is a prophecy of that event. As we read that portion of scripture where Christ is tempted, it says there about he was with the wild beasts. And later on here it refers to about treading on the lion, treading on the adder, treading on the young lion and the dragon. So the idea is that in all eternity, as God foresaw everything, he realised that one day his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would indeed come to earth, taking on him the form of a man, indeed being man, and he would go through this particular temptation. Obviously Christ was tempted all the time. We know in the garden when he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, he would have been tempted there. Father, if it be possible, let this pass from me, but if not, let thy will be done. So Christ was obviously tempted throughout his life. But this temptation is particularly put down in scripture. We know the story well. It came immediately after he was baptised. Our Lord was baptised and God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That was what God the Father said of Christ. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But then we're told that the devil, uh, sorry, that the Spirit of God drove Christ into the wilderness. It was the Spirit of God that drove Christ into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. We know 40 often comes up a lot in the Bible. It's always a sign of testing. And as been said before, and I must confess, I believe it was Jacko who mentioned it once at a Bible study. When you have a piece of gold, you prove it to be gold, not because you doubt that it is gold, but as it were to highlight the fact that it's gold. I, I hope you're seeing my reasoning. There was, there was never no doubt that Christ was God. There was never no doubt that Christ would fall to temptation. I know some people say that if he, wasn't, if he couldn't have fell, then it wasn't a temptation. But indeed it was a temptation, but he couldn't fall because indeed he was gold. And if you get a piece of gold, you do various tests on it and it says, yes, this is gold. And when the Spirit drove Christ into the wilderness to be tempted, it wasn't to see if he would fall to temptation. No, it was the reverse. It was to prove to the world, it was to prove to the devil that this indeed was the Son of God. This indeed was the spotless one, the one who knew no sin. So I know we call it the temptation, and indeed Christ was tempted, but I say again, not that he could have ever fell to temptation. It was merely to show that indeed he was the God-man. So in Psalm 91, I want us to look at this truth, but also, and I, I pray God that I can put this across how I want, the idea is that Christ was led of the Spirit to be tempted, but all of us tonight who are Christ, all of us who are real Christians, we are in Christ. We are in Christ this evening. And that situation never changes. The devil will tell you it changes. Some mornings we get up and we don't feel like praying. Sometimes we're downcast. We know that we should try and encourage others, but we feel we need encouragement ourselves. 
We are struggling. But our situation as a Christian never changes. We're in Christ. Just like Christ was in the Father. That never changed. Christ was in the Father. Through all those trials that he knew on this earth, he was always in the Father. And as I look at, as we, we look at several verses in this psalm, God willing, we'll see the truth. We'll see that Christ, he overcome all temptation. We are in Christ, and therefore, although we are sinners, and therefore, although we let God down, as God sees us, we're triumphant. We are triumphant because we're in Christ. We've said it so many times, but it needs to be repeated. Before God, we're his precious sons and daughters. We are pure, we are clean. Not because of the works of our hands, because we see within ourselves every day, we're failures. Speak to any Christian who's been a Christian for any length of time, and the first thing they'll talk about is their failings. We meet together, we talk, and we, we confess that we lost our temper on this day. This day we done that, this day whatever. The Christian is always ready to confess their failings because they're ever present with us, because the blessed Spirit of God dwells within us and it highlights our failings. But I say again, we are in Christ and therefore none of that is seen. If you remember Moses, when he was going to have that special, as it were, meeting with God. Incredible. There was Moses, and he was going to have this meeting with God, and he went up on the man, and it was as if God put his hand over this, like, this incline, this cave, and he walked past. And that is what Christ is like to us. He is the rock of ages. Is, is the cleft where we can hide under. We are in Christ, and Christ is in God the Father. And therefore, we need not fear. Now, I know again the obvious truth is we do fear. We are worried about things. But the scripture tells us time and time again we need not to. We need not to worry. And although we might look at it again in a minute, I do want to point this one bit out about our great enemy, the devil. He is our great enemy. And we need to be aware of him. Because, as I say, when Christ was in, in, in the wilderness, when he was going through those forms of temptation, the word of God was brought to him, but it was brought to him by the devil. And the devil put a bad spin on it, as it were. And often when we go to read the scriptures, the first thing the devil will say to you, well, that doesn't apply to you. Or he will say, if we read a verse, and we'll see some here tonight, about a thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand on thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. The first thing the devil will say to you is, well, what about those Christians who are being persecuted? What about that Christian in your church who's unwell? The devil will bring all these things to you, trying to steal away the wonderful truth of God's word. As we read the word of God, we need to apply it to ourselves. Of course, we will have trials. This whole psalm is about a trial. This whole psalm, however you look at it, whether you do believe it was a prophecy of Christ, whether you believe it, it, it's that psalm about Christ being tempted, or whether you just believe it is a psalm, the old psalm is about a trial and testing. But God is with us, and we will always be triumphant. And as I've said before, that if it were possible to find the weakest Christian who's ever lived, he is still in Christ. He has all the privileges that that has given to him. We're heirs of salvation. And this night we stand safe in our God. So if we begin to consider some of the verses in this psalm, first one says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
He that dwelleth in the secret place. But a secret place for us is where God is. It's a secret because the world know nothing of it. The world think we're foolish to believe that we're going to meet with God, that we're actually dwelling with God. It's the secret place. But that is where we are. We're with God in the secret place. The place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Well, there we have again the shadow of the Almighty being kept from all the storms of this life. And indeed, there are many storms. Again, if there wasn't troubles, we wouldn't need a shelter. If there wasn't worries, we wouldn't need a comforter. If there wasn't temptation, we wouldn't need a saviour. But the scripture tells us, in all these things, we, are, we will triumph. We are triumphing now, we have triumphed in the past, and we will triumph in the future. Because the devil and all his host of angels cannot stop any real Christian ever going to heaven. And again, it says in the New Testament, who shall separate us from the love of God? It was mentioned this morning by a pastor about how a parent loves their children. And in a sense, you could argue that sometimes they love them too much because they, they can't even see the wrong in their own children, even though it may be evident to everybody else. And that is how we are with God. He looks at his children, he loves us. He doesn't want any harm to us. And even though we do have to be tried and tested, it's a loving hand of God that does that. And many times it is Satan who wants to arm us. And it is merely God who makes those trials and temptations be for our benefit in the end. We are indeed in the secret place. We are with our God. He is our refuge. He is a shadow to us. And he will keep us from all evil. In verse 2 it says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. We need to trust in God. It's easy to trust in men. We can trust in men for different reasons. Sometimes you might look up to someone who's uh, as a spiritual uh, head, as it were, someone you look to spiritually. You may look to a parent. You may look to a friend. But obviously, the only person who we can look to with full assurance is God. People will let us down. They might not mean to. Sometimes events happen in life that no one can see coming. And as certain events in life, we're saddened by certain things. But if you trust in God, he will never let you down. People will let you down. No question. They can't help it. They're of the flesh. People will let you down, but God will never, ever let you down. He's like a fortress. Well, if, if you think of a fortress, they were made to stand up against a marauding army. And make no mistake, there is a marauding army against us. It is Satan and his demons. He is determined to spoil our Christian life. He is determined for us to succumb to his lives. When he tells us that God no longer loves us, when he tells us that things are never going to get any better for us. That is his marauding army, but God is our fortress. My God in whom I will trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. The snare of the fowler. Now if you think of that, again, I know very little about country life, but a snare, one thing we do know, it's, it's put there to catch a creature, maybe a bird, maybe an animal. But the thing of a snare, it's not visible. It's deliberately hidden so it becomes a trap. If all the traps were visible, the animals wouldn't go near them. But they put bait down and they hide them under leaves. And here's the idea, Satan 
he's, he's laying for us a trap. He's laying for us, and therefore we might not necessarily see it. Deliver me from the snare of the fowler. Deliver me from things that I might not yet have even seen. You can form a relationship with someone who's not a Christian. I don't necessarily mean the boy and girl relationship. It can be any relationship you can form with a non-Christian. It seems quite good. It, it seems all good. But that can be a snare. Because when you become friendly, you're more likely to do something that they want to do was you wouldn't have normally done it. That's just a small example. But the idea is the snare, it's a trap that you cannot see. And therefore you're more likely to fall in it. But God, we pray God all the time, keep us from the snares of the devil. But then it says from the noisome pestilence. And I confess, as you know, I'm not an educated man. And I assumed when I first read this, noisome was to do with the noise. Only because the other one was about a secret trap. I assume maybe this meant something noisy. I'm so glad I looked it up. It, it means a horrible stench. It means a real bad smelling thing. So in some ways it does bring out the same truth. Some things you can see and some things you can't. But some things you can smell. Some things have got a bad stench to them the rotting flesh of a dead animal. Sewerage, whatever it be, it has a rotten smell to it. Some things you can smell afar off and you can see it's going to be bad. But God will deliver us from all these things. From the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings thou shalt trust his truth and be, and be thy shield and buckler. Now again, when we think of the feathers of a bird, you think of the mother bird, and it, it reminded me of Christ. Do you remember Christ when he prayed over Jerusalem? And he said, how oft would I have gathered thee as a hen gathers her young? So there's the hen, she's got her little chicks, they're all running round her, and all of a sudden there's a noise, or there's a smell of, a, of an animal coming, and all the chickens, they run, un, run under her feathers, and she protects them. And that is what God is to us. We, we under his feathers, we're protected by him. We're near to his heart. And he is a, it, we're told that his truth is our shield and buckler. The truth of God, the word of God. It is a shield against the attack of the devil. We're all aware that in a moment we could fall to temptation. We're aware of that, and in some ways that's a healthy, that's a healthy knowledge to have. You know that you could fall. But the shield and the buckler is the idea that God's word is the thing to fight the devil with. We see Christ, he quoted the word of God on many occasions. He always quoted the Old Testament. He always went back to what the scriptures said. And of course, you can only, as it were, quote the word of God in your own heart if you know the word of God. Make yourselves more and more aware of the word of God. In some ways, it makes it easier today. Because you don't even have to read it. You can listen to it. Now, some people might say, well, that's lazy. Well, maybe it is, maybe it ain't. I'm not saying don't read it. But if it's easier for you to listen to it, listen to the word of God. You can listen to it so much today. You can let the word of God come in. You can digest it. And it is the word of God that is our shield. It is our buckler. It is our defense against all the things that Satan would throw against us. It says again, thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth in the day. And of course, when Christ was in the wilderness, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. There was a darkness. And then there was the heat of the day's sun. He went through both. 
The idea of the error that flyeth, again, you can look at that as temptation. You can look at the saints in the Old Testament where they were literal errors. You know, God's people, they were in battles. Errors would fly here and there. And their prayer would be, Lord, deliver me from that error, as it were, as it, as it flies. The error that flieth by day or the terror that comes by night. In all these things, we need God with us. We need his power. We need his help. Verse 6 talks about the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Now, the pestilence, of course, is rather, without exaggerating, if you look up what it says, it's rather like COVID. It's an epidemic. It's a plague. It likened it to the buponic plague. And the idea is that this plague has come on all the world. Now, of course, as I've said already, some Christians have died as a result of COVID. There's no doubt about it. We know that. And the devil might say to you, well, if there's a God, why did he allow these people to die? But we mustn't let the devil take away the truth that God has preserved so many of us. Let us be thankful that he has preserved us. He has kept us safe. It talks about the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Now, destruction, when, when the destruction comes, there is nothing left. And if we look at this in a spiritual light, we can talk about people's Christian life. If a Christian goes into deep sin and goes into bad sin, it can massively affect them. It doesn't mean they're not a Christian. We could refer to that man in, in the book of Corinthians who was actually having an affair with his stepmother. That's quite a big sin. He was thrown out the church for it. It didn't mean he wasn't one of God's people, but it was a terrible sin to be involved with. But the fact is, that didn't destroy his Christian life. It caused problems for his Christian life. It caused problems for the church. And the idea of destruction is that there's nothing left after. And the point I'm trying to make is that the destruction will not come upon us as people. So in other words, what sin you may get involved with, it, will, it may be bad sin, it may lead you to great repentance, but it will not destroy your Christian life. It will not finish it completely. Think of our friend Peter when he denied Christ three times. If you think of that, what a terrible sin that was. He'd been with Christ for three years. He'd seen all the miracles. He'd done miracles himself. He'd actually walked on the water. He helped feed the 5,000 with bread. And he boasted so much how he loved Christ. But then he denied him three times. And once it was just almost, we're told, like a, a young maid. But that didn't destroy his Christian life. And the devil has no weapon that will destroy your Christian life. Of course, we strive all our lives against sin. And we should never, ever, ever think we can sin freely because that is not what we are. We are the people of God. We are the children of God. And we love God and therefore we seek to please him. But the point I'm trying to make is, no matter what the devil does to you, no matter, he may, he may beat you on, in certain battles, he will never ever destroy your Christian life. And that's where it comes this verse, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. There are a lot of people in this world who by name are called Christians. Amazingly enough, I still think they say England's a Christian country. I doubt that it's ever been a proper Christian country. It did have much better spiritual days in the past. 
But the fact of it is, there's many that call themselves Christians and they will fall because they're not Christians. They're not in Christ. Their sins have not been forgiven. Again, we saw recently in John chapter 6 where many went back from following him. And there's no doubt, without being controversial, there's no doubt that some of those people who went back from following him had been baptised. Because we're told Christ baptised more people than John the Baptist, though Christ baptised not, but his disciples. The point being that many of his followers were baptised, but many went back from him. There are many that name the name of Christ who are not actually in Christ. But those that are in Christ, they are safe forever. In verse 8, he talks about seeing the destruction of the wicked, the reward of the wicked. The wicked were out to destroy our Saviour, for sure. But when we think of our Saviour, more importantly, on the cross, he trod on the head of Satan. That prophecy right back in Genesis, it shall bruise his heel, but it shall crush the head of the serpent. Christ knew that by his death on the cross, he would indeed destroy the enemy. The enemy of God, the enemy of God's church, the enemy of everything that is good. And Christ would see that. Christ would not only see the destruction of Satan, he would be the part of it. It would be his victory over death and over sin and his condemnation upon Satan that will eventually sentence him to eternal damnation. Because, we're told, he made the Lord, which is my refuge, the most high, thy habitation. There it is again. We're in God. We're in Christ. Everything that God has given to Christ has been given to us because we are in Christ. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. And this is where we get to this text, which is quoted in the New Testament. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. He shall give his angels charge over thee. Now, again, if you think of the temptation and you think of Satan, the Lord, the angels did come and minister to Christ. So, in a sense, there was the devil trying to, as it were, defeat our Lord by, by misquoting or by putting this verse in the wrong context about the angels of God protecting him. And yet, indeed, the angels of God were with him. We're told in, in those readings that we had that the angels came to Christ. They ministered to Christ. The angels of God were indeed with our Saviour. They protected him. But here's the other truth. The angels of God are with us. We are not in this battle alone. God is our Father. Christ is our Saviour. Christ has given all for us. But also... He has set his angels over us to protect us. There's certain verses that suggest that every one of us has an angel that guards us and protects us. How powerful is one angel? And again, I know it's easy to say, but if we could grasp the truth of God's word, we would have so much more peace in our lives. And as I've said before, and I'll say again, I say this word to myself as much as to anybody else. Believe the scriptures and you will have peace. You will have the peace of God that passeth all understanding if you believe what God's word is saying. His angels indeed will protect us lest we fall, lest we fall into temptation. Satan was defeated on every hand. But even though he's a defeated foe, he still comes against us 
every day. He says, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion, the dragon shalt thou trample underfoot. Whatever it was in the wilderness, and again we did read it, and I know I've mentioned this before, uh, so forgive me, but it's worth mentioning again. Here's our saviour. You, you go back to Adam when he fell. Here was Adam. He fell in a beautiful garden, a beautiful garden full of beautiful fruits and flowers. The smell of the fruits were lovely, let alone the taste. And Adam and Eve fell in an environment where it was beautiful. The animals were no threat to them at all. Without sounding too sort of emotional about it, you know, Adam could have stroked a lion. He more than likely did strike, stroke a lion. The animals were their friends. They had no fear of them. That was the environment where Adam and Eve fell in a beautiful garden full of food. Our saviour... When he went through this ordeal, and it says in the gospel, he was with the wild animals, wild animals. The animals that once were calm and loving, now they were wild. They was a threat. And that just shows what sin has done to our world. It once was a lovely world. And to be fair, in some cases, it still is a lovely world. There's still a lot of beauty in, na in nature. But how much better it was before the fall. But now, our Saviour is seen here with the wild beasts. But he would trample them under his feet. The idea is that they would have no hold over him. Why? Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. God gave evidence to Christ. He'd done it on several occasions. He'd done it at his baptism. He'd done it at that time in the temple when he was being questioned. They heard that voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. God gave evidence to Christ who he was. And the very scriptures that we read, the prophecies of Christ, the prophecies that came true, the things we've seen in our own life, they all give evidence to the fact that there is an eternal God and that his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is our loving Saviour. And he has saved us and he has kept us and he will continue to keep us because he has known my name. We have known the name of God. We have known him in the secret place. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honour him. Notice there it is again, I will be with him in trouble. This scripture's not saying that we won't have trouble. We will have trouble. Man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upwards, but God will deliver us in trouble. And sometimes it's difficult, but we have to stay in trouble for some while. Trouble sometimes for people can be a long-term thing, but God will be with us in it. And it's not irreverent, it's not irreverent at all to remind God of that in our prayers. Father, you said you would be with me in trouble. Then, Father, be with me in this time of trouble because I need thee. That is what God wants. God wants a closeness. God wants you to be near him. That's why he's got his feathers, as it were, around you. That's why he's got his hand over you in the cleft of the rock. He loves you dearly. And he will deliver you, those that honour him. And it says, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Once again, there's a promise there. I don't know... <laughs> What, what you take of statistics, what people say. But it was an article, and I actually, I wasn't looking for it at all. It fell out of my Bible. And it said that, was it 70% of women who go to church live longer than women who don't go to church? Now, you know, you can take from that whatever you like. But if you look at it from a spiritual point of view, of course, we will have long life anyway. Our life is never ending. When we leave this world, for some it's been earlier than was expected. 
For some, it may be longer than expected. We don't know how long we have on this world, but one thing's for certain. Firstly, as Christians, we get more out of our life than the ungodly. I'm sure we do. The Christian who's walking with God, the Christian who has that peace, is getting far more out of life than the non-Christian. But lastly, when we die, we shall live eternally with God. The one who has kept us through this life, the one who has sheltered us from all these fears, the one who has preserved us from the attack of the devil, we will live forever with our God. We need to hold on to those truths. May God keep us from all evil and may God preserve us unto the day when we go to be with him forever. Amen. And our last hymn is Amazing Grace.
Thank you for your wonderful word. Oh, Father, we pray for more faith. We pray for a blessed outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us. Oh, Father, be with us now. Be with us through this coming week. We do again think of that meeting tomorrow night. We pray, Father, that it would be a great meeting. And it would be a meeting that encourages people. And it would be, as it were, the beginning of a new time for our church in ways of evangelism. Father, hear our prayers this evening. Bless us as we part and keep us safe. For we ask it all in the glorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.